This is a physician's conference. We all are celebrating being a physician. Internal medicine is called as the mother of all the super specialities. But in a way, after spending more than 25 years in critical care medicine, I feel this specialty is nothing but an extension of internal medicine. I feel management of critically ill patients makes my understanding of internal medicine deeper and being a physician basically allows me to understand complexities of ICU patients better. There are a lot of other specialties like anesthesia, pulmonology, which also comes into critical care. But as a physician, I always feel there is an advantage. So both together make my professional life so fulfilling that I wholeheartedly recommend the residents in medicine to go for this specialty after MD. I owe my respects to three towering Parsi personalities, I must say, who were my guides at different stages in professional life. And what a coincidence, two of them are here on the dais, actually. But of course, my first mentor was also a great physician who bestowed the responsibility of starting and developing the Department of Critical Care Medicine at Ruby Hall Clinic at my tender age. And he was late Dr. K.B. Grant, who did believe the importance and need of critical care. The second one is our respected and beloved teacher, Dr. R.S. Wadia. <laughs> to study under whose able guidance, actually I left a seat in BJ Medical College and joined MD at Ruby Hall Clinic and it made a lot of difference in my life. He taught me many things. Thank you, sir. As a great teacher he is, but there is one thing, in initial days he never believed in critical care, those days. I was trying once to ventilate a severe organophosphate poisoning going into respiratory failure. And here he comes on the rounds and says, oh, that patient is breathing better than me. Just keep her away from ventilator. You may remember it, sir. And at the shallow respiratory rate of about 35 minutes, she decompensated shortly, and I had to connect her to ventilator. He would come on the rounds and throw away those long ICU charts saying that all this is humbug and hype. He may not remember it, and hopefully he has changed his views nowadays, with all due respect to him. But despite all this, I walked on the path I had chosen, because always there was a guiding light glowing on my path, reminding me to be a good physician always. And you guessed it right. He is none other than Padma Bhushan, Dr. Farooq Udwadia. <laughs> Sir, I'm so happy that you have honored all of us by accepting our invitation. It is quite customary in medical conferences to introduce the speaker with a CV. Dr. Udwadia is a distinguished physician of international acclaim in respiratory and critical care medicine. Professor Emiratus at Grant Medical College and JJ Hospitals, and director in charge of ICU at Breach Candy Hospital and Parsi General Hospital. He has over 55 publications in journals and monographs on emergency medicine, respiratory medicine, he has written widely about tetanus, which was one of his passions to treat the patients of tetanus. In early 70s, he had started a dedicated unit for that. He has written textbook of critical care medicine with Oxford University Press. These are to his credit. Man and Medicine is one of his books, which is worth reading. And Tabiat, this is one of his latest books, 
which I have really enjoyed reading in last few months. Dr. Udwadia was the youngest Indian at the age of 38 to receive FRCP London. And he also received the highest Indian award of Padma Bhushan in 1987. <laughs> but I feel this is incomplete introduction to this multifaceted personality. His journey in life is not restricted by medical knowledge and practice, but the way he applies it in life. Far more intriguing and setting an example for all of us. He treats luminaries, Bollywood stars, and general ward patients with titanus in JJ with equally deep, deep involvement and passion. He is curious, engages his intelligence and intuition to understand and treat a patient, and to make the patient feel better. That is what I have seen in close quarters in Titanus ward rounds, which were his critical care laboratories in those days. Respiratory failure and ventilation, hemodynamic instability, autonomic dysfunction in Titanus, monitoring with pulmonary artery catheters in those days. All this opened a different world of medicine for me in those days and prompted me to take up critical care as a path. This had a very important thought underlying that ICO is not machines, but a man behind the machines. I'm very lucky to observe it, and it inspired me even today, like Ekalavya and Dronacharya. In his latest book titled Tabiat, which I showed you just now, he has expressed his thoughts and perspectives, also first-person musings, on the topics widely ranging from humanities and medicine, war and medicine, music, man, and medicine, ethics and medicine, which he really loves to talk about. He has dwelt on the difficult topic of death, and I think that is one of his best essays. He himself likes it. We all experience death as doctors. That essay is worth reading yourself, where he has quoted many different philosophies, including Vedas and Upanishads, and Western philosophy as well. If you search him on Google, you will find his talks, including the one he delivered at our ICU Silver Jubilee function, with thousands of views and thousands of likes. But you will also find a totally different talk delivered by him on mankind and art. It is a one-hour flawless talk encompassing music, poetry, dance, visual art, literature, Indian and Western alike. He had delivered this talk at National Center of Performing Arts, developed by Dr. Jamshed Bhabha. Again, it is worth listening. But there's something you can't find on internet about him. How he invited his students home to celebrate a difficult patient's survival and playing violin himself to the students' gathering by himself. So I believe only a good human being can be a good physician. It's my proud privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to present to you, to light our path eternally, Dr. Farooq Erak Udwadia for his oration on journey of critical care medicine in India and ethics in medicine. May I please invite you, Dr. Udwadia? Thank you, Dr. Sate, for this very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, I feel rather embarrassed at the nice things you've said about me. Dr. Wadia and all distinguished members on the dais, Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, ethics, I think, is very important, and I'm glad she chose this subject rather than a technical scientific subject, <coughs> <coughs> because I feel ethics is one aspect of medicine which is going down today. 
all not only in this country but i think in most parts of the world the ethical journey i'm not going to waste time on very much but i don't think many of you know how critical care medicine started <clears throat> there i must confess i must talk a little about myself as little as possible i started it uh, at the breach candy hospital in the 60s between i can't remember the year but between 65 and 70 closer to 65 when i used to take just one room in the hospital and put a very ill patient there have a nurse there have a defib there have an oxygen cylinder in those days there and uh, have a breathing machine in that in those days the only breathing machine we had was a beavers ventilator no one must of you must have seen a beavers ventilator and that is where we nursed the patient and looked after the patient there was a ward doctor this was in one room in the ward a ward doctor and i insisted that the day doctor should sit all through the day he have his meals on the table there and the night doctor should sit all through the night and have his meals on there and we saved quite a few patients uh, then of course i remember the pa one patient that we i don't know if dr batia is here dr batia it was an anesthetist in pune and he was a friend of this particular american lady who came to us with difficulty in breathing one late evening when i was about to go to a picture theater but i stayed over she had ultimately with a cutting the long story short she had difficulty in breathing due to poliomyelitis and it was an unusual form of poliomyelitis because she was perfect in her limbs perfect in her cranial nerves absolutely perfect whilst i was standing there but went on complaining of difficulty in breathing then i realized that perhaps there was something wrong with her intercostal muscles and it was so suddenly she stopped breathing emergency intubation emergency ventilation first with an ambu bag and then at that time by that time a birds ventilator had come put her on a bird now this lady was 3 months pregnant and we nursed her in this one single room of critical care for a period of 6 months till she delivered on the machine so that was a thing which is a <laughs> it was so i can't tell you how how very sad and the interesting thing was uh, there was a big debate she was so hypoxic and cyanos by the time we could intubate and ventilate her shall we abort the baby or not i said wait why don't we ask her and we asked her and the lady said whatever happens i want the baby and if, thank god for it she had a perfectly normal healthy baby amazing isn't it there was cyanos hypoxic for quite some time but a perfectly normal healthy baby and then we had a two unit ward and then at last a 10 unit ward and this one interesting thing i found was the uh, difficulty in accepting the ventilator in patients who required it the ventilator was used then by the time there were units in mumbai but they were all largely related to cardiac units coronary care units they had ventilators but nobody used them and the ventilator was used almost as a parting gift to the patient before he or she reached god or the devil you see this is how it was it's so difficult for me to convince them that no that's not what you should do and when they put them on the ventilator also at the right time there was a tearing hurry to remove the ventilator so that all the advantage that you had gained through the ventilator was lost and the patient still died then of course critical care advanced you have critical care involving all systems cardiovascular respiratory neurologic and what have you patients and after transplant surgery special critical care i'm not going to go that in detail but you have critical care now care for all aspects and all branches of medicine where the patient is seriously ill i won't go into the details of now i want to talk on ethics The word ethics comes from the Greek word ethos. And mind you, ethics in medicine has been described for several years. The first description was by Hammurabi, king of Babylon, 
in 1500 BC, and there is an ethical code still seen in the British Museum on a steel. Then, of course, you have Hippocrates, you have Charaka and Susruta, you have several others describing ethics. Don't forget uh, Avicenna in the Middle Ages, a great Arabic physician, raises also. But the modern description and detailed discussion on ethics in some time in the 20th century, I'm not quite sure whether it was in 40s or early 50s, was by two British people. I think their names were uh, Beaufort, Be Beaumont and Childress. They wrote a book on bioethics. And every th major ethical problem or ethical principle that I tell you about was described by them. It's important to realize that you cannot easily separate ethics in everyday living from ethics in medicine, isn't it? After all, medical ethics merely a branch of general ethics. And how would you define medical ethics? I think it is the moral obligations governing the practice of medicine. That's how I would define ethics, the moral obligations that govern the practice of medicine. When you say moral, it immediately brings into your mind good and evil, right and wrong, and the duty of the physician to do what is right as best as possible for the patient's good. Now, ethical principles, you must realize, are deeply rooted in cultural philosophical and religious traditions. And these vary in different communities, different countries. So it's very difficult to have a general clean code of ethics all over the world. Nevertheless, the absolute value of right and wrong, of good and evil, and the belief in the sanctity of human life is generally accepted by all civilizations today. There is no question about that. Now, what are the basic principles of ethics? There are four basic principles of ethics. The first two are beneficence and non-malficence. And what is beneficence? Beneficence is doing good to the patient doing the best that you possibly can for the patient's interest, good interest. That is beneficence. Now, beneficence requires a certain amount of skill, isn't it? You're training a doctor. He's trained. Depends upon what degree he's trained. And therefore, it requires a certain amount of expertise and skill. And if a doctor doesn't have the necessary expertise and skill for a particular problem, it would be unethical if he didn't call in somebody who had a better expertise. That's one important thing. No one individual can know everything in medicine and surgery. So when you don't know or don't feel competent to address a particular problem, you need help and seek that help. But ladies and gentlemen, what I want to tell you it is not just expertise and skill that is important. There are human values that are equally important. And it is these human values which have unfortunately been pushed into the background by the advance and by the hubris of science and technology. What are these human values? The most important human values if I may, sir, is humanism or humanity? What is that? How would you define that? I think it is the ability, will I call it the ability? Yes, yes, perhaps the ability to be able to empathize with a patient, to care for a patient, to a point where you are impelled, the physician is impelled to do everything he can to relieve his suffering, and try and get him right, try and restore him to health. I think this is of great importance. In all medicine, particularly in a very ill person, why is it so important? When you have a, you see, 
a critically ill individual almost has an antenna to recognize a physician who cares for him or her. And when that happens, it's very important. It builds a bond between the doctor and the patient. And that bond is extremely important. In fact, the doctor-patient bond is crucial and the most, one of the most important things in all medicine, particularly in relation to a very ill patient. Why is it so important? It is important because it builds faith. It builds trust. And faith and trust in a doctor-patient relationship is a very important healing factor. I wish all of you would please remember that. So now, what are those other principles besides beneficence? I said there was non-malficence. Non-malficence means that do not do harm. Primem non nocere. This was the Hippocratic dictum. First of all, do no harm. But you must realize that it's sometimes impossible not to do harm. For example, you are treating something, you are giving a medication, you are doing a necessary procedure which has an inbuilt possibility of doing harm. What are you going to do about it? Important thing here, therefore, is to take a balanced view. Is what I'm going to do likely to do more harm than good or more good than harm? Is what I'm going to do having a possibility of a life-saving procedure or not? And Sometimes it is impossible to avoid harm. What then? The answer is that the doctor really is not responsible because he's acted in good faith. And I will quote you a great judgment by a chap, British judge called Lord Denning, when a patient's relative sued the doctor in the hospital. Why? Because the patient had severe pain, an elderly man, he was given the right dose of morphine to relieve the pain, but remarkably, he stopped breathing suddenly, and he died. This is called a double hit thing, or a double effect thing, something which can do good and something which can also do bad, can also do harm. But if the doctor, in his intent and purpose, has gone out to do something which he feels would benefit the patient, and instead of that, it hurts him. It is really not the doctor to blame. The doctor feels very bad about it, but he's really not to blame. That's the meaning of non-malfeasance. Please do not do harm. The sec third important principle, ethical principle, is autonomy. Patient autonomy. The self-determination of whether the patient is able to accept what the doctor offers him by the way of treatment, procedure, diagnostic treatment, diagnostic uh, me uh, methods or whatever he plans to use or the treatment that he plans to give. Once upon a time, medicine was paternalistic, which means it was as if the father told the son, you do this, the doctor tells the patient, you do this, he does this. Now there is patient autonomy. He will decide whether he wants what the doctor prescribes. This is extremely important. Patient autonomy really matters only after he, the doctor has been able to explain everything that is planned for him, what he wants to do for him, and also, not only that, if the patient comprehends what the doctor says. Then this is true patient autonomy. This is extremely important. That is how you have the consent for anything always written down before you do any procedure or follow. That means a patient has consented to do what you want him to do. It's important to realize that when a patient decides not to do what the doctor advises, what happens then? An autonomous decision, therefore, by the patient should be rational should be in the patient's own interests, and should be taken after proper critical thinking. If the patient has not done that, and says, oh no, I don't want this, tells the doctor, I don't want this, it's really not an autonomous decision, because it's not rational, 
it's not thought about properly and it is not really in his own interest. Now in these cases, what does one do? In the West, they will say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as you say that the patient is compost mentis and he says that he doesn't want this, it, we will do exactly what the patient says. But I don't think I really would agree. You see, the conflict arises when there is a conflict between beneficence, that means doing good to the patient on the one hand, and an autonomous decision on the other hand. In fact, the practice, the management, decisions, practice of medicine, particularly in critical care, is really a delicate balance between beneficence and autonomy. Let me give you some examples and true to life examples. A patient, young boy, not young boy, a young man comes with bad pneumonia, cyanose, pulseless, pressureless, but compost mentis, still barely recordable blood pressure. I don't want to be put on the ventilator. I hate machines. I don't like hospitals. I'm not going to have the ventilator. Call the wife and please explain. He won't live, he won't survive. He's terribly hypoxic, he's cyanosed. Please, and the oxygen hasn't helped him, let us put him on the machine. The wife pleads with him, please. He says, no, well, you don't understand. I, they, these doctors are all fools. I don't want the machine, I don't want any ventilator. What do I do? Doctor, I'm warning you, if you put me on the ventilator, I, if you want me to sign, I'll sign it, I don't want the ventilator. What do I do? This is a young man, a wife with a child. Beneficence tells me, why God, he's going to die if I don't do something about him. But his autonomy tells him, don't do anything to me. I won't have it. Well, I told you, in an emergency situation like this, beneficence prevails over autonomy. So we knock him out with midazolam, we intubate him, we ventilate him. After a lot of struggle, after 10, 12 days of struggle, he gets well. He's perfectly well. He leaves the like ICU all smiles and distributes sweets to everyone, you know, saying thank you, thank you for getting me well. You see what I mean? Another example, I give you another example, I'll give you two more examples. A doctor patient, you know, uh, takes some poison, kill, wanting to kill herself, and almost succeeds at killing herself, and has a note clasped in a fist which we read, under no circumstances am I to be resuscitated. What do I do? I don't know why she did it. She might not have been in her right senses. She might have been depressed. She might have been a depressive, psychotic person. We'd ignore that. Intuit, ventilate, look after, get swell. Again, is very happy that she's alive. An individual with Guyen Barre with progressive paralysis involving the respiratory, again, no machine. I won't have it. I won't have it. What do I do? Again here, I think beneficence prevails over autonomy. We resuscitate the patient, we'll keep him on the ventilator for a long time, recovers, goes well, very happy. The point is that autonomous decisions are very often affected by prejudice, by by, by anger, by anxiety, so that, you know, they're not really what the patient wants because his mind is completely not what it should be. Anxiety, panic, fear, distrust of hospitals, distrust of doctors, all these sometimes make them make a wrong choice. So, so though I respect autonomy as such as a principle, I may not respect his choice, particularly in a life-threatening emergency. I think that is very, very important to remember. Yes, in a cold case, when the patient has a time to consider, when a patient has a time to consult others, other doctors perhaps, relatives, friends, and then makes his mind after due consideration, rational thought, critical thinking is applied to the problem. And then he says, I don't want this, you respect that, even if it is against your own wish. So you have beneficence, non-malficence. You have patient and not autonomy. And finally, you have justice. These are the principles quoted in the book, 
that I told you about, actually. Justice meaning that you must do good and as far as possible do no harm at all. And if you can't do which, something which is absolutely good, at least make sure that you don't do as, you do as little harm as is possible while trying to do what you are doing. That is all justice. I'll never forget the experience I had in my tetanus ward when we started the tetanus ward. Imagine about 10 tetanus patients convulsed, all terribly ill. We managed to get two machines, two ventilators, nice ventilators, good ventilators in those days, sometimes in the very early 80s. Now, who do I give these ventilators to? I say, well, I'm going to give it to the people who I think might die, they're the worst people, so I give it to, to these two. But then after some time, another two become extremely bad. What do I do? Do I take off the ventilators? How do I do? How do I perform justice? Where is justice? We were fortunate that on an appeal to the Breach Candy Hospital, they said, all right, we'll take all your poor patients. We won't charge them. If you can't manage them, bring them to us. And that's how we survived and the problem was solved. But it can sometimes be a very difficult problem. The next ethical problem, not written in that book, but which we see now, is communication. It is extremely important to communicate with your patient, to talk to the patient, to tell him everything that has happened to him, tell him everything that you're planning to do, why you want to do that, why you don't want to do something else which he asks you about, to explain all that to him. It makes the patient an ally an ally so that you and the patient fight the problem together. And that indeed is indeed a very, very great advantage. Also again, it helps to build trust and faith between the doctor and the patient. And that again is very important in healing. It's not just necessary to communicate with the patient it's very important to communicate with relatives. If you want to save yourself from legal suits, you must be spending more time. Sometimes I have to spend more time with the relatives, explaining to them what is happening, why I have done this, why I have not done this. Then they understand what you are going through, what the doctor is also going through. I can't tell you how important that is. And finally, as far as I am concerned, <clears throat> I love to communicate with myself. And how do I communicate with myself? For every really bad patient, every really bad critical patient, I write a detailed summary every three to five days. Detailed meaning really detailed, about five, six, seven pages as to what has happened to the patient. Also, what have I done? What have I not done and why have I not done? What I anticipate is going to happen to him. And how am I trying to be one step ahead of the possible complication. That's very important in critical medicine, to be one step ahead of what is likely to happen, to anticipate what is likely to happen. I write all that. So no one can ever then say, and, and this is a good catharsis for my mind. It, when I write all this, I sometimes wonder, ah, I missed out on this. I should have done this a day earlier. I wish I had done this a day earlier. Or why have I not thought of this? Why have I not given him this? These are the thoughts that come to you when you are writing it out, everything on piece, on a paper. So that is meant by communication, communication with the patient, communication with the relatives, and also in a way, communicating with yourself. And if you do this, there is no earthly person in the world who can haul you up and say, because if you've written this, it shows that you are cared for your patient. How can anyone say you have neglected? Anyone can make a mistake. Who hasn't made a mistake? I must have made any number of mistakes for sure. But if you've written everything out, it shows that you have cared as much as possible for your patient. So no one in the world can ever haul you up and condemn you that why did you make this mistake? You understand? So that, that I think is very important. So communication is very important. I think charity is also an ethical principle, particularly in critical care medicine, because the cost is immense. The cost sometimes runs into 40, 50, 60 lakhs in a very, very critically ill individual when everything is being done. So we have a system 
in the hospital where we presented to the CEO and said, this patient has paid 60 lakhs already, for God's sake, you know, give him a discount. And most of these cases are considered by the trustees and they give a maximum discount of about 30 to 35 to 40 percent, which is pretty good. And of course, the doctor has also to be prepared to forego his fees if the patient says, I can't pay you. It's fine if you can't pay me, it doesn't matter. So this is very, very important. So you have communication, you have charity, and finally you have confidentiality. Whatever is happening to the patient is confidential between the doctor and the patient. So any outside person who wants information is not to be given that information without the consent of the patient. Even if the CEO asks me, what is happening to this patient? I mean, I have so many people have been ringing me up. I said, I can't tell you what is happening to the patient. I can only tell you that this is his disease. This is what he is suffering from. Then I can't give you any more information than that. Unless the patient asks me, allows me to give it to you. The confidentially, therefore, is extremely, extremely important. Now, there are certain other aspects of critical care medicine which I'd like to speak about. The first is the considered use of technology. You see, it's the doctor and the nurse who looks after the patient. The machine and the gadget, the other gadgets that you have in a critical unit, are merely adjuncts to the doctor and the nurse. They cannot replace the doctor. And the, a machine can't look after the patient. The machine can help a doctor do something or make adjustments or think of different ways of management if needs be. It's also very important to realize that every procedure, invasive procedure in particular, carries a risk. Carries a risk of harming the patient and sometimes even killing the patient. So you have to take a balanced view. What is the benefit and what is the risk? And if the risk is clearly more than the benefit, it is wise not to do it. And all these procedures that carry a risk are more so in people who are new, who are young, who are not uh, exposed for a length of time, who do not have the expertise or the experience of using them. So that, again, is extremely important. So machines, I, don't, I, I do not decry the advance of science and technology. It is science and technology that has catapulted medicine into the modern age, mind you. But nevertheless, it has to be used with caution and with perspective. That indeed is extremely important. It is very important to remember that in today's time, with the advance of science and technology, with so many gadgets around and so many machines around, the newer intensivists, the younger intensivists, more easily relating to the machine than to the patient. The machine becomes the interface between the doctor and the patient. The patient, therefore, is not directly concerned. It's a machine that comes in between. And he also makes the patient relating more to the machine. Like, for example, the patient with a headache will say, Doctor, I want an MRI. I say, Why do you want an MRI? No, no, I asked to have an MRI. I have a headache. The doctor encourages that. Instead of saying, Rubbish, I'm not going to get an MRI. There's no need for an MRI. You see the point? So that is why a proper considered relation to machines and gadgetry in the ICU is extremely, extremely important. Now I want to stray just a little bit from the ethics to a point of great importance. I'll tell you why. Many years ago, there was a professor from the West, you know. In those days, there was, uh, there was the use of uh, uh, a drug, I won't name the drug, for the treatment of septic shock. And there was this professor who was very keen on this drug. And uh, he had done a lot of work on it. Activated protein C, that was the name of the drug. That was the drug concern. 
and he felt that it was the important thing to use in septic shock and he was lecturing on it and when he came to the unit and I said look I find this very expensive you know and I've tried it in one or two people and they bled very badly after that you see he said this is the drug which has been proved on evidence evidence based proof evidence based medicine in my country doctor if you were not to use this drug for septic shock you could be sued I said, is that so? Really, is that so? All of you know that that drug was ultimately found to be useless and harmful and dangerous. So when you talk of evidence-based medicine, you must take a nice, proper perspective. Of course, it's important to have properly controlled trials, randomized controlled trials to know a particular drug or particular mode of management is important in a critical in individual and is shown to be independent by various trials. Good. That's to a point. But also remember that most of critical care medicine, particularly emergency medicine, is empirical. It's impossible to get proof and it would be unethical to try and get proof to find out what mode of management one must do or one must be, uh, try, and, uh, try and, uh, and enforce, you know, in a patient who is critically ill, who has multiple, multiple other variable factors, multiple, multiple comorbid conditions as well. This is extremely, extremely important. It is also important to realize that all critical trials, uh, evidence-based trials con consisting of controlled double-blind trials, are usually carried out on a large number of people. And there are many exclusion factors when they take these people into the trial. They need not necessarily apply, therefore, to the patient you are actually treating. Because the patient you are actually treating might be having exactly those factors which have been already excluded by those people. So that's, again, extremely important to remember. You see, the double blind trials are supposed to be the most double blind, you know, randomized trials are supposed to be grade A from the point of view of evidence. And observational, uh, you know, observations in medicine which are thought to be, uh, which are important, are thought to be the least on the lowest grade. But the greatest advances in medicine have been made through great clinical observations. I'm thinking of Pasteur, who did the anti-rabic vaccine. I'm thinking of Lister, you know, who introduced aseptic surgery. I'm think of, thinking of uh, Semmelweis, who showed that hand washing was so important in preventing infection. I'm thinking of Jenner, for example, who observed it cowpox and made, made, made it from that, you know, made the observation how smallpox vaccination was done. These were fantastic observations and made it responsible for fantastic advances in medicine. These observations far, far, far greater than any observations or any conclusions drawn from double blind trials. Doesn't mean that they are not double blind trials, evidence-based medicine. Of course, it is important. Also, but people don't, the younger people don't realize <coughs> that evidence can change after years. Evidence is not sacrosanct. If it were, medicine would be static. But the history of medicine, all medicine, any branch of medicine is a chronicle of change. It's important to realize that. It's very, very important to realize that. So though evidence-based medicine is important in all fields of medicine, including criti critical medicine, I would just conclude that though it is important, yes, important, it is not infallible. Though it applies to many people, it does not apply to all. And there are many other facets in medicine as such, social, economic, philosophical, psychological, and now genetic coming into prominence, which really matter and which a good physician 
will always, always bear in mind. Let me now just talk to you just on a few other critical ethical problems. Should a physician tell a dying patient that you're going to die? You s always speak the truth, isn't it? When a patient is ill, you tell him the truth. This is what you got. This is what I'm doing. I told you, you communicate with the patient. Are you going to communicate the fact that, Mr. B, I'm sorry, you know, I think you're, I think you're going, and this is very bad. It's gone from bad to worse. I've tried everything, everything. We've all tried. But I think you're going to, go, you, you sooner or later, you're going to die. What then? Would you say that? Answer is no. I would not say that. I would not say that. Every person who is very ill, for one thing, very often doesn't accept the fact that he's going to die in his mind. I'm telling you this from experience. And even if he knows even in his heart that things are up against him, he's going to die. The feeling that he has, I can make out, is that the doctor thinks so, everybody thinks so, but I have a, thing, I have a feeling that I will live a little longer than what they think. And they will usually not talk about death. Very, very, very few critical ill individuals talk about death. A question sometimes arises, an intelligent person says, Doctor, am I going to die? What are you going to answer him? A very important question. How do I answer him? I usually have a stock. I say, uh, Mr. So-and-so, everyone dies. You know that I'm going to die, he's going to die, she's going to die, he's going to die. Everyone dies. It, when the time comes, you die. When the God wishes to call you, you die. But no, uh, have I got long to live? Then he's asking you a specific question. He's compost mentis. So I said, with a disease like this, see, advanced cancer, the usual expectancy is about say four to six months. But, you know, I've seen quite a few people who live much longer. Usually the conversation ends that. He doesn't ask more questions. Of course, I have come across some patients who want to hold my hand. And however busy my, I am, however busy I am on my rounds, I hold the person's hand and he or she sometimes talks about death. And I listen and I reply. I've had that on perhaps four or five occasions that I've been able to do that and spend almost half an hour every round, every day on the round like that. And the questions are quite interesting. Questions are, what do you think happens after death? I said, I really don't know. Nobody's come back, you know, to, to tell us that. But I can't help feeling that the next world is going to be a much better world than this. Is that so? I said, yes, it is so. This is what I feel at least, and I really feel so. So I'm not telling the lie, I'm, I'm telling the truth. And I had some wonderful experiences like that. And it almost, almost makes me cry when I come out of that room, because two of these were very young girls who were dying. And they didn't want to die, but they were accepting it, and they were talking about death. And I quite remember once, I came out of the room and started humming something. So the, the, my registrar and resident saw it, and Sir, he was so upset. Now why are you humming something? So I said, I'm humming something so that I do not cry. That's how it is. So this is, again, I tell you about... Uh, now, is there something else I want to tell you? Yes, you must remember there are limits to critical care. And you cannot fight death all the time, and you must have the wisdom and the experience to say, this is enough, let him be, let him go in peace right now. So the end of life, particularly, you must be able to know what the end of life is. That again is so difficult. When is the end the end? 
That's important. Is the end uh, a patient with metastatic disease might take, uh, with severe metastasis, might take weeks or even a month two to die. It's much better to talk of a terminal illness, which is more easy to understand. Even that is sometimes difficult. And you must always review an individual whom you call terminal. I can't tell you how important this is. Because anyone who has worked in medicine, leave aside critical care for a long time, will realize that sometimes those you feel are going to die, come alive and leave the hospital. And those you feel who are definitely going to live, die. So there is an unpredictability about life and death, which you must understand. But when you know for sure that there is an end to everything, you mustn't protract the agony of death. That is why it is wiser not to use support when you see an individual who is going to die for sure. It is better not to use support, and it is more difficult that you use support and then have to withdraw it. In legal terms, you are not supposed to withdraw the machine, but many of us do now, when you know that it is a hopeless condition. Is there anything else I would like to talk? Yes. I would lo like to talk about something very interesting in critical care. It is important that all medicine, particularly critical care medicine, is holistic. Unfortunately, today, it is compartmentalized. Compartmentalized means somebody looking at the liver, somebody looking at the lungs, somebody looking at the heart. And I am amazed sometimes and in despair, because ours is an open unit, quite a few people besides those immediately attached to the hospital can sometimes admit patients. I'm amazed and sometimes in despair when I see a very ill individual being surrounded by 10 or 11 consultants. The poor permanent intensivist who's there was standing behind the curtain because these are all big people, you know. What can you do? The cardiologist is looking at the heart. There's a fellow with the lung who's looking at the lung. He has had a headache during his illness. The neurologist comes in. Why is the anemic, the hematologist comes in? Is there any other entity left? Yes, all of them come in. Ah, the kidney, of course, man comes in. He's suddenly had a drop in urine, call the nephrologist. Array. So you compartmentalize. And if you ask any one of them, then any one of them, because then sometimes I'm called, now you tell me what to do. So I ask, hey, just tell me the story. Just tell me the story, please. No one knows the story between them. No one did tell me what started, how it started, how it progressed, what is happening now. Absolutely. It's the question of too many cooks spoil the broth. And if there are so many people, poor patient, he might as well say goodbye from the beginning. This is, this is, this is a sad thing. This is an unethical thing, I think. It is an unethical thing. Is it that the doctors are called because let's say, let's, this big fraternity, you know, uh, let each one make a share in this fellow's poor fellow? Is that what it is? How can you ever, ever treat a patient like that? Now I'm old enough to say I have rubbish. I don't want a nephrologist. He's got a fall in his urine output for this reason. I don't want a hematol. What do you expect with a man with so many problems if his hemoglobin is not going to be 10? What is it going to be? 16? You follow? He's drowsy because of this reason. Will you want a neurologist? He's not got a neurological problem at all. But sometimes, you know, even I am forced, a relative, but I want somebody. What do you do? Oh, hell, get, want somebody, get somebody. But holistic medicine is extremely important. You must look at the patient as a whole. Unfortunately, with the presence of modern science, modern gadgetry, gleaming new machines, all young people particularly are more concerned with these machines than with the patient. So you see people coming into the ICU and talking to the register very philosophically, show me this, show me that, show me this. And I'm shocked that they don't even 
speak to the patient, leave aside, touch them. The art of history taking, which is so, so, so important, so important, is lost. As is the art of a close, complete, dedicated physical examination. It's lost. So this is what makes me sad. This is really what, this is what critical care sometimes has, not always, not always, mind you, not always, has descended into. Now I shall end by just giving you a brief, very brief talk on another aspect of medicine. You see, people seem to forget in this day of advancing science and technology that medicine is both an art and a science. It is as much an art as it is a science. It was William Osler who said medicine in those days, in the 30s, 1930s, that it is a science of possibility and an art of probability, giving an equal balance to art and science. And what is then the art of it? The art of medicine cannot be quantified, like science can be quantified. It is, uh, what shall I say, properties of the, both the mind and the heart which empathize with the patient and try and help him to get better. I would define the art of medicine as the artistic, if I may say so, artful, not artistic, artful application of the science of medicine to the holistic care of a patient. That's what the art of medicine is like. How shall I express it in practical terms? The art of medicine is being able to grasp an unspoken nuance in the history. To be able to spot physical signs, subtle though they may be, which are important, but which cannot be obtained by any gadget, any machine except the use of the eyes, the ears, and the hands. The art of medicine lies in your ability to sift the evidence that you have in front of you and pick out the exact correct answer amongst the many possible answers to a very relevant question. I think the art of medicine also lies sometimes for those who have practiced long an intuitive feel as to what is happening to the patient and what should be done to him. The science this will scoff at this, but I think there is something to what I've said. The art of medicine is looking at the patient holistically and not compartmentalizing him into various organ systems. The art of medicine, ladies and gentlemen, really speaking, is the art of healing, not just curing. But it is only when art and science join hands that healing can really occur. Both art and science join hands. It is only then that a physician can appreciate the individuality of a particular patient so that he considers the patient not just as a disease that has to be cured. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I think I must have exceeded my time because I haven't timed myself. I'm very grateful to you for listening to me and I thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Sathya, to this lecture. Thank you, thank you. I think we will cherish his words in our minds all our life. Hello, yes. Thank you, Dr. Udwadia, on a lovely lecture on doctor-patient relationship and the art of medicine given by the father of intercritical medicine in India. Thank you. Requesting Kakrani sir and Dr. Sanjay Gandhi sir to felicitate Dr. F. E. Udwadia sir.
Udwadia, madam, requesting you to come on the dais, please. Madam, please come. Requesting Prachi Sati, ma madam, to felicitate Udwadia, madam, please. Requesting Dr. Sangre, madam, and Dr. Manzrekar, sir, to felicitate Dr. Wadia, sir. 